Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 10, and it is entitled Motion Graphs. Let me say from the outset that I don't care for the examples your textbook authors use to illustrate the points, so I've chosen some different examples, ones that are more realistic, ones more like what you're likely to encounter in familiar situations. We may see these graphs again in a later lesson, but for now, we're only going to focus on average velocity average acceleration, and displacement. So let's begin with some definitions of average velocity and average acceleration. These are common sense ideas that we wish to express mathematically. The average velocity is the distance traveled divided by the time interval. You've already used this expression to solve several numerical problems in previous lessons. We can also express this using delta notation. So V is equal to delta X delta T. And the arrows indicate vector notation. This means the same as X2 minus X1 over T2 minus T1. Take your ending position, X2, and subtract from it your starting position, X1. That's the displacement, delta X. Then take that and divide that by the elapsed time, delta T. Those of you who are in calculus can spot a derivative. If you shrink this time interval to zero, you end up with the instantaneous velocity. And we'll do a similar thing algebraically in a later lesson. For now, though, we'll focus on finite time intervals, usually of several seconds in duration or of some other appropriate time units. In a similar way, we can write average acceleration, the change in velocity divided by the time interval. We say that when our velocity is changing, then we are accelerating. We've heard this before in Newton's first law, the law of inertia. An object travels with a constant velocity unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. Eventually, we'll use this change in velocity, this acceleration, to connect us to the causes of changes in velocity. We'll call these causes forces, which are basically pushes and pulls. Again, you calculus students will spot a derivative associated with this delta notation. Shrinking the time interval to zero makes the expression become the instantaneous acceleration. Now, it's important to realize that these are vector quantities. There's not only a number associated with each of them, but there's also a sign, a direction, that goes with each of them. That's the meaning of the arrows that are written above each quantity. We'll be working in a reference frame that has a specific origin. Initially, our reference frame will be only one dimensional, but we could extend it into three spatial dimensions. The sign of the number tells us the direction of each quantity with respect to the origin of our given reference frame or our coordinate system. We're going to be looking at three different types of motion graphs on a regular basis. A position versus time graph, a velocity versus time graph, and acceleration versus time graphs. As a preview of coming attractions, Eventually, we're going to construct one type of motion graph from another type of motion graph. Say, for instance, we're given an x versus t graph, and we'll be asked to construct a v versus t graph with it. Or maybe we'll be given an a versus t, and we'll be asked to construct a v versus t. These graphs generally describe objects moving in only one dimension. Imagine a cart on a number line that has its origin at zero and you have the cart at a certain point when the clock begins ticking at t equals zero seconds. You record at, say, one second time intervals, starting at zero seconds, then one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, etc., until you're finished looking at the cart's motion. Then you plot these points on a position versus time graph. Examining the x versus t graph, you can calculate things like the velocity and the acceleration. Oftentimes, students will get a little confused with these graphs because they'll see the variable x on the vertical axis because they're used to putting x on the horizontal axis. What I want you to remember is that what's being represented on a position versus time graph is where and when the object is located at certain places. Time represents the independent variable, and that's the reason time is plotted on the horizontal axis. Sometimes you'll use data acquisition equipment, like a motion detector connected to a computer, in order to examine the motion of a cart that's on a track. And basically, 
the computer does the same thing that you do if you're holding a stopwatch in your hand except the computer is looking at very very small time intervals one one thousandth one ten thousandth of a second at a time and plotting the position versus time and then making calculations with it all of this is similar to what you would do if you were holding a stopwatch in your hand and recording the position versus time over one second time intervals let's also notice that in reality most familiar objects have very complicated motions. In this course we'll idealize the motion and study nice clean graphs. We'll only look at small time intervals to use to study the motion of our objects. Our idealizations will give you a starting point for looking at more complicated motions. If you use data acquisition equipment to come up with these graphs, you'll see that the graphs that you produce in the laboratory won't be quite as clean as the ones we'll look at in class. Your authors summarize in the textbook some important facts about motion graphs on page 67. I'll write these points down and discuss them one by one, and afterward we'll apply them to four numerical examples. Number one. The slope of an x versus t graph is velocity. You can see that from the delta notation definition of average velocity. And that leads us to number two. The slope of the line connecting two points on an x versus t graph is the average velocity. This second point is a corollary of the first. If the time interval is long, the slope tells us the average velocity of the object during that time interval. If we shrink the time interval to shorter and shorter times, then the average velocity gets closer and closer to the instantaneous velocity at a given point in time. The slope of the tangent line of an x versus t graph tells you the instantaneous velocity. The slope of a v versus t graph is acceleration. Again, the delta notation gives us that point. And that brings us to number four. The slope of the line connecting two points on a V versus T graph is the average acceleration. This is an analogous corollary to the concept linking position and velocity. The characteristics of one graph produce the other graph. Let the time interval on a V versus T graph be large, and the slope of that line connecting those two points gives you the average acceleration but shrink the time interval and the average acceleration becomes closer and closer to the instantaneous acceleration. Again, calculus students will spot these relationships fairly readily. Finally, number five. The area between the time axis and a V versus T graph gives displacement. We all come to call this area the integral and the process of finding the area known as integration in calculus is just as the process of finding the slope of a graph is known as differentiation. In this course, we'll actually do some integration, but we're not going to use it analytically as we do in calculus. Rather, we're going to approach it graphically using simple figures like rectangles and triangles, adding up the areas of these common figures and physically interpreting their meanings. Now, let's turn to applying these five points to some specific examples. Example 10.A. The graph of position versus time of an object moving in one dimension is shown. What was the object's average velocity during the first 30 seconds? And B. What was the object's average velocity between 30 and 50 seconds? How are we going to approach this problem? First of all, let's look at the two times that they want us to examine. In part A, we're looking during the first 30 seconds. So I want to figure out where those two points in time are. Now what I want to do is I want to figure out what are the object's position at those times. I want to connect those with a line. You want to use a straight edge when you do this. Don't try to draw these graphs freehand. You'll want to use a straight edge because that straight edge will help you when it comes time to calculating slopes. All right, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find the average velocity. Since this is a position versus time graph, I want to find the slope of that line. And the slope of that line is the rise divided by the run. Where did my object start? Well, it looked like that it started at the origin. x1 was equal to 0 meters. And the time at which it began was 0 seconds. So there is my first data point. What about at the end? Well, at the end, it looks like that I ended up 
about 16 meters. So my x2 is 16 meters and my t2 is equal to 30 seconds. So now I want to figure out what was the change in the position divided by the change in the time because that's what my average velocity is. Well that's going to be delta x divided by delta t or x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1. And now I put in the numbers. x2 was 16 meters, x1 was 0 meters, t2 was 30 seconds, t1 was 0 seconds. And now you pull out your calculator and you come up with a number. I find that the average velocity was 0.53 meters per second. That's a positive number. That means that the object was moving away from the origin during this time interval. Part B. What was the object's average velocity between 30 seconds and 50 seconds? Well, I'm going to play the same game now. I'm going to find these two points and then do the same thing with the data. My starting point for this time interval is the same as the ending point for the other one. Now I go to 50 seconds and I find here that at 50 seconds the position was 10 meters. The time here is now 50 seconds. So now I'm going to feed that into my definition of the average velocity. Now in this case x final is 10 meters and x initial is 16 meters. So this 2 and this 1 subscript you could change if you wanted to to be final and initial. In this case my final position was 10 meters my initial position was 16 meters. My final time was 50 seconds and my initial time was 30 seconds. And again I'll put that into my calculator. And I find the average velocity is negative 0.30 meters per second. So what that means is that the object turned around. And you can actually see that if you were to sketch this line you can see that it has a negative slope. So my rise in this case is a negative rise and that means that the object was moving in the negative direction. Now it was still on the positive side of the origin. We can see that because the position is always a positive number. I started at plus 16 meters, I ended at plus 10 meters and I didn't cross the origin but I was moving back toward the origin in the negative direction and that's what that negative sign means. Let's go on to another example. Example 10b. Determine the average velocity during the following time intervals from 0 to 3 seconds in part A and B from 3 to 6 seconds and in part C from 6 to 10 seconds. Let's do this one by one. Part A. Starting at t equals 0 and going up to t equals 3. There is the two times in question and now I want to sketch a line that connects those two points together and I want to find the slope of that line. It looks to me like I start at x is equal to 0 when t, t is equal to 0. And it looks like I end up at x is equal to, that's 1, 2, 3, looks like 3 and a half meters when t is equal to 3 seconds. Let's say that our x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1 is going to be 3.5 meters minus 0 meters divided by 3 seconds minus 0 seconds. And now you put that in the calculator. This object had an average velocity of plus 1.67 meters per second. Sometimes the velocity was a little faster, sometimes it was a little slower, but on average it was 1.67 meters per second. Now I want to go from 3 seconds to 6 seconds. It looks like that the 6 second time interval is there. I started at 3 seconds at a position of 3.5 meters. But now at 6 seconds I see that my position looks like it's 2.5 meters. So now I want to find the slope of the line that connects those two points. That line right there. Let's figure it out. My final position was 2.5 meters. My initial position was 3.5 meters. My final time was 6 seconds. My initial time was 3 seconds. So now I'll put that into my calculator. I find that the object turned around. It actually moved in the negative direction. Still on the positive side of the origin, but moving in the negative direction with an average speed of negative 0.3 meters per second. 